I got really heated when Ms. Flores wouldn't call on me in class. I knew the answer, too. What are the two primary forms of energy produced by a burning candle? Anyone? I started to feel invisible, like I wasn't even there. The lava started racing through my veins, and before I knew it, I had accidentally melted my chair down to the floor like candle wax. I ended up in Principal Westview's office. If you can't learn to control yourself, you could end up where Paul's is, the Institute for Supervillains. Were Principal Westview and Ms. Flores giving up on me like they gave up on Paul's? All I knew was the Institute was not a place for me. But after my parents had a talk with Principal Westview, something pretty cool happened. They split up my class and added a new teacher. Now we can begin. The amazing Bobby Beacon is here. So glad to see you, Bobby. My name is Miss Brooklyn. She really called me amazing. And she said she was glad to see me. That stuck with me all day. Meet Derek Barnes. He's the author of many beloved books, including I Am Every Good Thing, Crown, An Ode to the Fresh Cut, and the Ruby and the Booker Boys series. Today, he's speaking with us about his new books, Santa's Gotta Go, and Like Lava in My Veins. Derek Barnes, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to talk to you about Like Lava in My Veins. This yes. book is really, really good. Yes, thank for you. our readers who haven't had a chance to read it yet, can you tell us a little bit about the story? Yeah, Like Lava in My Veins is my 18th book. Uh, I've been in the business since 2004, and uh, I always wanted to do a like a comic book type of picture book. So this is kind of one of the first ones. It's a comic book, graphic novel hybrid. And it's about a 10-year-old boy who has the power of fire and light. And his parents send him to a school to help him learn how to control his powers. But when he gets there, the teacher is mean. She's constantly threatening him to kick him out of the class. So his parents come up, have a meeting with the principal, and he's transferred to a new classroom. And the new teacher is very nice, and she's very welcoming and very warm. And this book is just really a shout out to all those educators across the country that go out of their way and use their own resources to make sure their babies have what they need. The teachers that go out of their way to learn the culture uh, of the students that they're teaching that uh, go out into the community where the students live. Because I, I really feel like you can't really teach a child if you don't really know them, or if you don't love them and, 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 and don't understand their uh, culture. So uh, I just try to squeeze all of that into uh, this 40 page picture book. So. It came out extremely well. I'm so proud of the work that Sean Martin wrote. Did. He's an amazing comic book illustrator. He works for DC. He's done work for Marvel, Batman, Static Shock. Just a privilege and an honor to be able to work with him. Most of your other books don't have a format like this. They're not a comic style book. How is working with an artist different for something like this than when you're just doing a standard storybook or picture book? So I've done a graphic novel. My first graphic novel is a young adult book entitled Victory Stand. And it's about the life of 1968 Olympic gold medalist Tommy Smith. And the book did extremely well. It was my first time really writing in graphic novel format, which is totally different from doing picture books. It's similar to screenplay writing, where you have to write from scene to scene. And I had to pretty much do the same thing here. And I actually went after Sean. I, wanted, I always try to use new illustrators or illustrators sometimes outside of the uh, business. And I was able to get his information and ask him and he said yes. This was his first children's book project. Well, it's really fun to read this book and I want to talk to you about some of the characters in it. Sure. I'd really like us to focus on Bobby Beacon first. Yeah. So, why fire powers? There's so many superpowers you could yeah. have picked from. Why um, fire? So it's a it's a it's an old um, gospel song um, like "Fire Shut Up in My Bones." Um, I, I just remember hearing that when I was going to church as a kid. So that was one of the things that stuck with me. But also, I wanted him to have a power that seemed uncontrollable, and it would take a lot of love and a lot of focus to really get him to kind of hone that in. And who better to help him hone his energy and his power in than a great teacher? And in a few instances in the book, she teaches him how to calm himself down, meditation. A lot of schools around the country are using that in exchange for, you know, suspending kids or sending them to ISS. Uh, they are um, allowing them to use, you know, conflict resolution, but also just to 
you know, meditate and just, you know, to center themselves. But there's a scene in the book where he is fighting off an attack and he has a hardened lava shield that shows up. And he didn't know he could do that. And a lot of that was because he had a great teacher. This is a very loving, understanding teacher. So, and it's just, this character is kind of based on one of my sons. I have four boys and my second eldest boy was a very kinesthetic learner. He had to get up and move constantly. Smart boy, but he had to get up and move. And I think teachers have to accommodate for the different, because every child learns differently. And so I had to learn that as a, a parent. You know, my eldest boy was able to sit down for 20, 30 minutes uh, Solomon, no, maybe five, ten minutes, maybe. And I had to adjust to that. So that's, this character is kind of loosely based on him. Can we talk about that teacher that helps him out, Miss Brooklyn? Yeah, Miss Brooklyn. She has a line she says a few times, it's peace be still. Yeah. Can we talk about what those words mean? I use a lot of poetic phrases and, you know, the idea that we all have a center of peace inside of us. And sometimes we have to tap into that, especially when you're feeling anxious or you're feeling angry. And I think she, she was able to tap into that. But first of all, I think she gained his trust. Uh, when he first walked into the classroom, she said, the amazing Bobby Beacon is here. I'm so glad to see you. He had never heard that from an adult before, that he was amazing. And, and she was glad to see him. So I think she earned his uh, trust, which has allowed him to open up and to uh, tap into that peaceful side of himself. For readers reading this book, if they're going through similar stuff as Bobby, yeah. what do you want them to think about? You know, even though I wrote this for kids like my son, you know, I, I think it's important that adults really tap into this book as well. I really, like, again, I wrote it for a lot of the teachers across the country who may be having the issues with trying to, you know, connect with their students. And I think the most important thing you can do is to learn as much as you can about that student and just treat them like human beings and learn as much as you can about them so that, so that they can open up. And then you'll be able to optimize, you know, because we all have superpowers. We all are able to do something that other people find challenging. And uh, like I, I discovered my superpower when I was uh, 10. I had an amazing fifth grade teacher, Miss, Miss Shelby. Shout out to Miss Shelby. I had a great English teacher when I was in high school, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Rogers. Everything I wrote was like Pulitzer worthy, uh, even though I know it wasn't. But she encouraged me and she kept me moving forward. And you know, without those teachers, I wouldn't I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. So. And we wouldn't be able to read these great books you're writing. Thank you. So Thank like. You. What the teachers did for you yeah. helped you do these things for everyone around you. Most definitely. That's something that kind of comes up in the book, and I don't want to give away the ending because this is a really good book. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't want any, any of our readers that haven't got a chance yet to read it to have it spoiled for them. Thank you. But the lessons that Bobby learns from Miss Brooklyn, he doesn't just keep them bottled up inside. He uses them for other people around him. Yeah. He's very kind to his new friends. He meets a kid named Sincere. Sincere's power is he's able to touch you and make you tell the truth. And Sincere's never had friends. And Bobby befriends him and says, you never have to touch me to make me tell you the truth because that's what friends do. And there's a young girl named Pauls that got expelled and kicked out of school for the misuse of her powers. And she was able to come back. And a lot of that was because of Bobby. Bobby said, well, hopefully you guys believe in second chances. I would love to have her back in the classroom. So. A lot, of that, a, a, a lot of the things I use in my book are just things that I teach my own children to just be kind and, you know, he has the power of light. That's one of the things I, I tell them. When you walk into a room, I want you to be the light that walks into the room. The people are happy to see you because you're going to always say good things to them. You're going to always be kind to people. And I think these things have to come from home and be a constant reminder. Like, hopefully we send we send in good people out into the world. You know? and, and so a lot of those things come up in regards to themes you know, in my books. And I just get it from Raising the Mighty Barnes Brothers, you know. <laughs> well, this is a really, really good book, and I encourage any of the readers watching to check this out. But this isn't the only book you put out there this year. No. Because we also got Santa's Gotta Go. Santa's Gotta Go, yes. <laughs> now, this is one of the funniest books I have read in a very long All time. Right. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about it? So my third son, Silas, he's the only boy that feigned to believe in Santa Claus. Everybody else was like, we don't believe in Santa Claus, but he did. And he thought it would be really cool if he said, man, Santa could come by the house and eat dinner with us. He, and maybe he could eat some jollof rice and, uh, you know, Nigerian food. Um, 
maybe he can play 2K with us and, and hang out. And I was thinking to myself while he's talking, I was like, what if Santa would be a horrible house guest, man? You know, and so we created, I created this story where Santa, uh, his last stop of the night is at this family's house, it's the Mack family, and his sleigh breaks down. He needs a new fuse. So he goes into the house, he orders the fuse, and it takes three days for the fuse to come. So he asks the family, would it be cool if he crashed there until the fuse? And they were so excited until the next day he has formed a garage band with two other old guys in the neighborhood. He makes noise all night. He doesn't clean up behind himself. He eats everything in the refrigerator. He breaks everyone's personal items. And it's so bad that when the fuse actually comes, uh, the family actually stays in a hotel the last night. They can't take it anymore. When they come back, the house is clean, he's replaced everything, and he leaves a note, and he essentially says that uh, he just wants to thank them for being so kind. They are the epitome of Christmas spirit, opening up their home to, to, to St. Nick, and he's gonna tell all of his friends. And so uh, three weeks later, they hear a knock at the door, and when they go to the door, they look stunned, and I can't tell y'all who the family actually sees, but uh, I think this is one of the best endings I ever came up with. So I, I had a lot of fun writing this book. The whole book is just a fantastic ride. Thank you. Man. <laughs> so one of the things I love most about it is like in my mind, yeah. and I imagine a lot of readers' minds too, especially the young readers we got, mm -hmm. if you're asking them, who's the most perfect guy in the whole world? Yeah. <laughs> Santa's high up on that That's list. Right. Because he brings us presents, right? <laughs> it's interesting to see how even someone who you think is just so perfect and so great, yeah. they can have some problems. That's right. He's just human. He's just human. I wanted to talk about uh, how perceptions of things can kind of change when you get to know someone better, both good and bad, mm -hmm. and why it's important to like be able to experience a person like the whole person, not just what your idea of them is. Yeah. I think it's important to not have any heightened expectations, um, and, and that's really hard. When you don't when you don't know someone, you have this idea, and that can and lend itself to, you know, stereotypes. Or if you don't have a friend of a, of a certain ethnic group or they come from a different part of town, you may have an idea about them. But what's most important for us to remember is we're all human beings. We all have our strengths, weaknesses. Uh, we all have different interests. But there are a lot of similarities, more similarities than there are uh, things that we don't have in common. So uh, even if you have a heightened idea of somebody, I think it's important to kind of temper what you think you know about them until you get a chance to know, you know that person. And in, in this story, Santa, this is a different kind of Santa too. I, I made sure he looked like he worked out regularly. He loves playing the guitar. He has tattoo sleeves on his arm. So he's not your daddy's uh, Santa Claus. This is a different Santa, but uh, I just want him to be really cool and really you know, relatable. Um, if, if Santa did hang out, you know, you get to see him as a person, you know. Well, it's unlike any Santa I've ever encountered, and I love this version of <laughs> <All> Santa. <right. laughs> Good. I appreciate that. So I'd actually like to go back to Like Lava in My Veins for yeah. a minute. Yeah. Bobby Beacon, his story feels like it's unfinished, like there could be more to it. Yeah. So the, the last page in the book, I left a uh, teaser. And the three kids, Sincere, Pauls, and Bobby Beacon, they form a group which I'm gonna share in the second book called the Garvey Park Trio. That's the name of the neighborhood they're from. And so we're gonna lean more into that. I've written four books and what would be a, a, a series, you know, hopefully the next book may come out in 2025. Uh, the earliest is the fall of 24. So like I said, I've written four more books. I have aspirations of it becoming an animated series. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed with that. We'll see. And going back to Santa's Gotta Go. Yeah. I told you before we got going here that this feels like the kind of story that could be just a regular story every family in America reads around Christmas time. I love that. Thank you. Is there anything else we can expect for it? Maybe in the future, any hopes or possibilities of a follow up? Each one of my books I always have aspirations of it becoming. Uh, you know, going outside of the pages. So uh, that's one of the things that my agent used to tell me that I write like um, like a screenplay writer because I see the book becoming a film or animated series. So I've already started writing a screenplay for what this animated series would look like. And I'm like you, I, I see it as a staple on one of these streaming services. But 
Um, yeah, I always think a couple of steps ahead. I want to write for as long as I can, but I would like to teach uh, on the college level, and I also would like to get into you know animation, you know, eventually. So uh, hopefully, these two books, Santa and Like Lava, are some of my first two projects. We'll see. Well, I hope we get to see more both on the page and on the screen in the future. Yes, most definitely. Do you have any other books you're working on right now that you're able to tell us about? I'm working on uh, two books. I just finished one. It's a um, nonfiction book called Do It For The People. I wrote 14 original essays and 14 original poems centered around uh, African-American athletes who have used their platforms to uh, protest racism. And that book is with uh, a illustrator that I've won a lot of awards with, Gordon, Gordon C. James. And uh, the other book is a collection of African folk tales. And it's, it's uh, five stories that I'm working on. And again, Gordon C. James is the illustrator of that book. So I'm actually working on that right now. I, I stay working on two to four projects at a time. So. so Derek, a lot of the stories you write have similar themes to one another, mm -hmm. but they always feel very distinctly different. Can you tell me a little bit about how you write the stories to get these kind of points across in so many different ways? Yeah, I get a lot of my ideas from either my sons. Uh, I look at what's going on in my community. I look at what's going on in the, in the uh, country. And I also look at the market of books that are out and, and what other people are talking about. And I try to fill in those gaps. What are they not talking about? And so I address those. Like probably my best-selling book is I Am Every Good Thing. It's a picture book. I was on tour for another book, A Crown and Ode to the First Cut. It was in 2018. I saw an ad by a major clothing company. It was an international ad, and they had a collection of children, beautiful children from all over the planet, and they had hoodies on. They all said different things. And the African boy had a hoodie on that said, the coolest monkey in the jungle. And it just, it just really blew me away that that got through marketing, and they thought that was a great idea, just kind of dumbing down on these, uh, these, these, these negative stereotypes of African Americans in this country. So I wrote a whole list of things that I think about when I think about my sons. I've never referred to them as a monkey, obviously. So everything from the center of a cinnamon roll to waking up on Saturday mornings during the summer and going swimming and watching cartoons, uh, and just every good thing I can think of. And that became a book. So I really try to address things that are going on in our community and things that really affect black children. Um, but my writing process starts with an idea. I write down, I, um, I write down ideas. I outline what chapters would look like, uh, what the flow of the book would look like. I even write down a tentative title. And then I just go from there. If it's a nonfiction book, it takes me two to three months to compile my sources, which I love doing because I'm just an information, nerd information junkie. And I have to do a ton of reading. And while I'm reading, I'm taking down notes or I'm highlighting parts that I'm going to use. If I'm writing fiction, again, outlining is so important. And the most important thing we can do is just get started. Uh, so I have, I have like an outline of the time I'm going to take to write each chapter. And sometimes I chop chapters down into like a week. And so um, for the first three days, I have a, a word count, you know, in mind. And once I'm done with that word count, I just shut it down for the rest of the day. And everybody has a different process, but I, I do mine in that, in that kind of format. So. But it's not just planning out, like, what you're doing, but how long it's going to take. Yeah. Managing time also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so important. When I was 10, I was diagnosed with um, type 1 diabetes. And so I've been a diabetic for 38 years, and I just I always try to find a blessing in things. And being a diabetic... At such a young age has helped me in regards to time management, you know, discipline. And I apply those things in my writing, you know, um, as well. And, and obviously, we have to meet deadlines. So I'm a real stickler on that, trying to meet my deadlines as well. So, so when you're doing all this planning and all this writing, do you write and work on this stuff every single day? I write every single day, every day. Um, one, one of the slogans in our house, I have a, a whiteboard in the kitchen. And on Monday, I write down a quote that maybe I came up with, and it's the Barnes Brothers whiteboard wisdom of the week. But one of the slogans in our house is, there are no off days. So uh, they understand that you have to do extra. And if you, if you, the thing that separates great people from 
um, people that just do enough is that the great people do extra. And, and that should apply to everybody. So I, it doesn't mean that you don't take breaks, that you don't have uh, self-care moments, but we should all be doing something, at least 20 to 30 minutes a day to help you, you know, improve. So writers write, and you write every single day. Like I said, I'm working on two or three projects at a time, so I can't afford to really take any uh, days off. So I'm constantly writing, and I'm also constantly reading. I collect books uh, that's kind of in the vein or, or in the genre of what I'm writing. So if I'm, if I'm working on fiction, uh, I may be reading four or five poetry books at a time because I want the poetry to um, you know, be reflected in the character dialogue. I want my characters to be able to talk in a poetic way. These are things that the reader are gonna hold on to. So um, I'm reading every day and I'm writing every day, every single day. That's some great advice for our young writers out there who are wanting to get started too. Yes. Derek, before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance to talk directly to the people watching, the readers who are going to be picking these books up, yeah. and just tell them anything you want them to know. I really pride myself on writing books that center the beauty and the brilliance of black children. But it's important that those of us that do illustrate and write books for children make sure that we tell the story of every child because I feel like every child deserves the right to go to a bookstore, a library, and see a character that looks like them. But it's also important for all of our children to read everybody's story. I mean, that's how you create empathy. That's how you create, you know, understanding, tolerance. And so I'm, God willing, going to do my part for as long as I can to create as many books as I possibly can that will um, hopefully, you know, inspire and make children feel good about themselves. Well, Derek, the books I've read by you, and I did, I read way more than this. All right. <laughs> They all do everything you just said and more. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really thank appreciate you, you being on the show thank today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.